Computer Science 410, Computer Architecture, Chapter 14, Processor Structure and Function. These slides correspond to Chapters 14.1 to 14.3 of the 10th edition of the text. In particular, we discuss processor organization, register organization, and the instruction cycle. In the next lecture, we'll focus on instruction pipelining and give some more details about the x86 processor family and the ARM processor family. Let's begin by looking at processor organization. So the processor has several requirements. One is to fetch instructions. So read an instruction from memory. That could be from the, a register, from the cache, or from the main memory. Two, interpret instructions. The instruction is decoded, and we find out what action is required. Fetch uh, data. So the instruction may require us to read data from memory or get data from an I.O. module, maybe input from a keyboard, for example. Process data, the execution of the instruction require, might require performing some arithmetic or logical operation on the uh, data. Some of those shifts or uh, adding things or uh, subtracting things, uh, multiplication, etc. Uh, write data, the results of an execution may require writing the data to memory or an I.O. module, for example, putting something out to the screen or storing it in internal memory. In order to do these things, processor needs to store some data temporarily, and so it needs a small internal memory, which often takes the form of registers. So uh, if you uh, have your book, uh, there's um, figure 14.1. This is actually figure 14.2, but 14.1 is a simplified view of the internal structure of the processor, and you can find that on page 490 of the 10th edition of the textbook. Uh, this figure is 14.2 on the same page, and it shows a slightly more detailed view of the processor. You might recall that the major component, uh, components of the processor are the arithmetic and logic unit, or ALU, and the control unit, the CU. The ALU does the actual computation or processing of the data, while the control unit controls the movement of data and instructions into and out of the processor, and controls the operation of the arithmetic logic unit. In addition, the figure shows a minimal internal memory in the form of the registra registers over on the uh, right. Uh, data transfer and logic control paths are indicated, including an element uh, labeled internal processor bus or internal CPU bus as it's depicted in this figure. This is needed to transfer data between the various registers and the arithmetic logic unit because the arithmetic logic unit in fact only operates on data in the internal processor memory. The figure also shows typical basic elements of the arithmetic logic unit. Note the similarity between the internal structure of the computer as a whole and the internal structure of the processor. In both cases, there is a small collection of major elements. The computer has a processor, I.O., and memory. The processor has a control unit, arithmetic logic unit, and registers that are all connected by data paths. So let's take a look at register organization, and this is uh, section 14.2 of the text, and it talks about how we organize registers inside the uh, processor. So within the processor, there is a set of registers that function as a level of memory above main memory and cache in the hierarchy. The registers in the processor perform two different roles. One are the user-visible processors. These enable the machine or assembly language programmer to minimize main memory references by optimizing the use of the registers. The control and status registers are used by the control unit to control the operation of the processor and by privileged operating system programs to control the execution of programs. It's not necessarily a clean separation into these two categories. For example, on some machines, the program counter is user visible. For example, it is on the x86 architecture, but on many it's not. And for the purpose of the following discussion, you know, we can use these categories. Anyway, let's talk about the uh, user visible registers first. A user visible register is one that may be referenced by means of the machine language that the processor executes. We can characterize these into the following categories. One, general purpose. These can be assigned to a variety of functions by the programmer. Two, data registers, which uh, may be used to hold data and can be cannot be employed in the calculation of an operand address, so they can't be used for uh, lookup. Address can be somewhat general purpose, or they could be devoted to a particular addressing mode. 
and condition codes, which are also referred to as flags. These are bits set by the processor hardware as a result of operations. Uh, there are several different design issues to be addressed here. An important issue is whether to use completely general purpose registers or to specialize their use. We've already touched on the issue in the last chapter because it affects instruction set design. With the use of specialized registers, it can generally be implicit in the opcode which type of register a certain operand uh, refers to. The operand specifier must be must only identify one, one of a set of specialized registers rather than one out of all the registers, thus saving bits. On the other hand, the specialization limits the programmer's flexibility. A second design issue is the number of registers, either general purpose or data plus the address to be provided. Again, this affects the instruction set design because more registers require more operand specifier bits. Um, between 8 and 32 registers appear to be optimal. Uh, fewer registers require uh, more memory references, whereas having more than 32 does not noticeably reduce memory references. However, there is an approach uh, that uh, finds, use with, uh, finds a use for hundreds of registers, and that's exhibited in some risk systems, which we're going to discuss a little bit later in the course. Uh, there's also the issue of register length. Registers that must hold addresses obviously need to be long enough to hold the largest address. Data registers should be able to hold values of most data types, and some machines allow two contiguous registers to uh, be used it, um, in conjunction with one another to hold double length values. Finally, some registers hold condition codes. Programmer generally can't alter them. Uh, some processors don't use condition codes, and let's see why that is. So condition codes are good because they're set by normal arithmetic and data movement instructions, and they should reduce the number of compare and test instructions needed. Uh, condition instructions such as branch are simplified relative to composite instructions such as test and branch. Uh, condition codes facilitate multi-way branches. For example, a testing instruction can be followed by two branches, one on less than or equal to zero and one on greater than zero. Condition codes can be saved on the stack during subroutine calls along with other register information. So those are the good things. Uh, disadvantages is that it adds complexity to both the hardware and software. Condition codes are often modified in different ways by different instructions, and this makes life difficult on both the microprogrammer and the compiler writer. Condition codes are irregular. They are not typically not part of the main data path, so they require extra hardware con connections. Often condition code machines must add special non-condition code instructions for special situations anyway, such as bit checking, loop control, and semaphore operations. In a pipeline implementation, condition codes require special synchronization to avoid conflict. So these are the pros and cons. Uh, let's turn our attention to the control and status registers. So four registers are essential to the execution to instruction execution. One is the program counter, uh, which contains the address of the instruction to be fetched. Second is the instruction register, which contains the instruction that has been most recently fetched. Memory address register contains the address of the location to memory, and the memory buffer register contains a word of data to be written to memory or the word most recently read. And not all processors have internal registers designated as the memory address register or the memory buffer register. But some equivalent buffering mechanism is needed where the bits need to be transferred to the system bus that get staged and the bits to be read from the data bus are temporarily stored. Typically the processor updates the program counter after each instruction fetch, so the program counter always points to the next instruction to be executed. A branch or a skip instruction will also modify the contents of the program counter. The fetch instruction is loaded into the instruction register where the opcode and operand specifiers are analyzed. Data are exchanged with memory using the memory address register and the memory buffer register. In a bus organized system, the memory address register connects directly to the address bus and the memory buffer register connects directly to the data bus. User visible registers in turn exchange data with the memory buffer register. Now let's look at a set of registers known as the program status word. And many processor designs include a register or a set of registers, often known as the program status word, or PSW, that contains status information. Typically contains condition code plus other status information. Common fields or flags include sign, 
contains the sine bit of the result of the last arithmetic operation. Zero, this is set when the result is zero. Carry, set if an operation resulted in a carry into or borrow out. Uh, subtraction of a higher order bit, and that's used for multi-word arithmetic operations. Equal, which is set if a logical compare result is equality. Overflow, used to indicate arithmetic overflow. Interrupt, enable, or disable, used to enable or disable interrupts. And supervisor indicates whether the processor is executing in supervisor or user mode. Certain privilege instructions can only be executed in supervisor mode. And certain areas of memory can be accessed only in supervisor mode. There are some other status and control registers that can be present here. If you want to read about them, they're on page 494 of the 10th edition. The control and status register is influenced, and they are influenced by the operating system design, among other things. Another decision is the allocation of control information between registers and memory, which ends up being a cost versus speed issue. The book also gives some case studies uh, of register design for the Motorola MC68000 and the Intel 8086. Motorola had a regular instruction set and no special purpose registers, whereas the 8086 had a number of special purpose registers. In general, there's no universal philosophy as uh, what's the best way to organize registers. Another issue in the design is maintaining backward compatibility with earlier machines. Now let's uh, review a bit about the instruction cycle. And this corresponds to chapter 14.3 of the text and gives them uh, more details beyond what we discussed all the way back in chapter 3, particularly in regard to the indirect cycle and data flow within the instruction cycle. So in section 3.2, we describe the processor as instruction cycle. It contains the following phases. Fetch, read the next instruction from memory into the processor, and, and execute, which interprets the opcode, uh, through uh, decoding and performs the indicated operation. I usually separate out the uh, decode and execute, but uh, the author here combines the uh, two. And interrupt. If interrupts are enabled and one of them occurs, save the current state and process the interrupt. We can now add some things, such as the indirect cycle. So the execution of an instruction may involve one or more operands in memory, each of which requires a memory access. If indirect addressing is used, then additional memory accesses are required. Think of fetching indirect uh, addresses as one, uh, or as one or more instruction stages that happen. So the result of adding the indirect cycle is shown in this uh, figure. The main line of activity consists of alternating instruction fetch and instruction execution. After an instruction is fetched, it is examined to determine if any indirect addressing is involved. If so, the required operands are fetched using indirect addressing. Following the execution, an interrupt may be processed before the next instruction. So this is the instruction state diagram with the indirect cycle added for the operand fetch and operand store portions of the cycle that are depicted in the uh, center upper and uh, right upper portion of the diagram. The exact sequence of events during an instruction cycle depends on the design of the processor. However, we can talk in general terms about what needs to happen. So let's assume the processor employs a memory address register, a memory buffer register, a program counter, and an instruction register. During the fetch cycle, an instruction is read from memory. The program counter contains the address of the next instruction to be fetched. This address is moved into the memory address register and placed on the address bus. The control unit requests a memory read, and the result is placed on the data bus and copied into the memory buffer register, and then moved into the instruction register. Meanwhile, we increment the program counter by one, uh, preparing for the next fetch. Once the fetch cycle is over, the control unit examines the contents of the instruction register to determine if it contains an operand specifier using indirect addressing. If that's the case, we do an indirect cycle. And this is a pretty simple uh, cycle as we saw in the uh, last slide. The rightmost, rightmost in bits of the memory buffer register, which contain the address reference, are transferred to the memory address reference, or memory address register. Then the control unit requests a memory read to get the desired address of the operand into the memory buffer register. The fetch and indirect cycles are simple and pretty predictable. The execute cycle takes many forms. The form depends on which 
of the various machine instructions is in the instruction register. The cycle may involve transferring data among registers, read or write the memory uh, to or from I.O., or the invocation of the arithmetic logic unit. Like fetch and indirect cycles, the interrupt cycle is simple and predictable. The contents of the program counter need to be saved so the processor can resume normal activity after the interrupt. The contents of the program counter are transferred to the memory buffer register to be written into memory. Special memory location reserved for this purpose is loaded into the memory address register from the control unit. It might, for example, be a stack pointer. The program counter is loaded with the address of the interrupt routine and the next instruction cycle will begin by fetching the appropriate instruction from the interrupt routine. If you want to see more details on this, take a look at uh, figures 14.6, 14.7, and 14.8. And those can all be found on page 498 to 499 of the text. So next time we'll look at pipelining. And that's a pretty important concept, so we'll focus on that uh, rather than the details of uh, how the x86 and ARM implement uh, these uh, types of processor design issues. We'll cover all three of those items, but most of our focus will be on pipelining.